Okay, this is the panel, What Women Are, the Imagio Dei in, in Creation, and I am Mary Helen Fiorito. I am the Cardinal Francis George Fellow here at the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, along with the um, Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., and I'm an attorney who's worked in the pro-life movement for many, many years, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the three women that you have before you today, uh, all of whom have incredibly impressive experience and education in the particular issue that we're going to be uh, discussing. So our first speaker this morning will be Erica Bakiaki, who is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute. Uh, she is an attorney and a mother and has uh, her newest book, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, was published by Notre Dame Press here in 2021 and has received great critical acclaim even from some of our opponents. So we will begin with Ms. Bakayaki. Thank you. And just a uh, critique from some of our friends, I might add, for any of you have ha happened to read a uh, journal of note. Um, it's great to be here, always love this conference. Um, and waiting for my daughter to arrive, who goes to Notre Dame and has apparently stood me up. So, <laughs> in response to new state laws restricting abortion after Dobbs, we've seen a bevy of lawsuits in states such as Ohio, Wyoming, and Utah claiming that abortion restrictions discriminate on the basis of sex. So, for instance, in enjoining Ohio's heartbeat law this summer, a state judge wrote that the, that the law clearly discriminates against pregnant women in violation of Ohio's Equal Protection and Benefit Clause. Similarly, a Wyoming District Court judge wrote, quote, the legislature cannot pass a discriminatory law on the basis of sex that restricts the constitutionally protected right to make one's own health care decisions. So the question I want to address in my remarks here tonight is not why this claim is obviously wrong, but rather why it seems to strike so many as so obviously right. To do so, I'll look first at early arguments for sex discrimination law and the account of women's role and capacity these arguments worked to reject. I'll argue that these arguments properly hold together three aspects, three key aspects of who we are as human persons that are rightly accounted for in our law. I'll then show on the same basis where this uh, series of kind of claims that we're hearing about goes wrong. As many likely know, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, an, as an ACLU attorney, chiefly responsible for convincing the Supreme Court in the early 1970s that discriminating arbitrarily on the basis of sex was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of uh, the 14th Amendment. But Ginsburg drew many of her arguments from noted civil rights attorney Polly Murray, who in an important 1965 article had persuasively argued, to my mind anyway, that the protective cover of the 14th Amendment though initially intended to outlaw racial discrimination, was broad enough to protect women from arbitrary class discrimination. The trouble, according to Murray, was that laws too often classified women according to the biological function of motherhood, or otherwise judged them unfit due to unfounded assumptions about their rational capacity as a class. One need not dig very deeply into US legal history to find illustrations of laws that restricted women as a class from participating in public-minded activities due to their biological function and accompanying unfitness. The most notorious, perhaps, is the 1872 case Bradwell v. Illinois, which upheld a state statute prohibiting married women from practicing law. In Bradwell, Justice Bradley wrote for the court, quote, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The constitution of the family organization, which is founded in the divine ordinance as well as in the nature of things, indicates that the domestic sphere is that which properly belongs to the domains and functions of womanhood. The biological function of motherhood, the functions of womanhood, reproductive function. This phrase and its variations was employed in the law until the 1970s in a fashion that often served to disparage women's rational capacity and or curtailed women's participation in public life. But of course, this idea of a woman's role as being determined by her biological function was not unique to American law. 
Indeed, it is a very old idea with an impressive Aristotelian pedigree. For Aristotle, of course, defined a thing by its, a thing's excellence, excuse me. Aristotle defined a thing's excellence by its function. Just as the excellence of an eye is found in it operating well according to its seeing function and the excellence of a lyre player in playing the lyre well, so too the excellence of the human being, qua human being, Aristotle tells us in book one of the ethics, is that he live in, according with, in accord with his highest rational function. A thing's function then is synonymous with a thing's purpose. Its perfection is found in carrying out that function or purpose perfectly. For the human being, this means a life lived in accord with virtue. We are telic beings, properly oriented to our highest end. So far, so good, or I would say so great. <laughs> but even if, for Aristotle, both men and women are human, and so bas basically rational, and therefore both designed to live virtuous lives, men and women differ fundamentally on the basis of their reproductive or biological function. It is, of course, precisely this function that differentiates the sexes. And this difference makes all the difference for Aristotle. Woman's childbearing function determines her distinctive domestic role, which determines how she is perfected in virtue. This gendered division and diversity of functions and gift in the household, Aristotle writes in the Ethics, is for the common good of both the household and ultimately of the city. And so while men are meant to practice virtue and so find perfection both inside and outside the household, women reach their perfection only inside the household. Since women are rational insofar as they are human, they can achieve a kind of feminine excellence in their sphere. But women's rational capacity, Aristotle also seems to imply, is somewhat deficient. And so for their own good and the good of the household and of the city, women should be ruled by men, just as the rational soul rules and orders the body. And thus, women lack both the capacity and the leisure to take part in the public deliberations of the city. Now, there's much in my view to commend Aristotle's rich discussion of the deeply interdependent and politically essential household, not the least of which is his view of the spousal relationship as a potentially virtuous friendship. My limited point here is that 2,000 years, but very little in the way of substance, separates Aristotle's account of women's distinctive function from Justice Bradley's in 1872. Oh, sorry, yes, 1872. You'll remember Bradley wrote, in the nature of things, the domestic sphere is that which belongs properly to the domain and functions of womanhood. Both accounts circumscribe women's place in accord to her, with her reproductive function, and, so, and also perhaps to this kind of deficient reasoning capacity that seems to accompany it. And this account is, of course, what Murray and Ginsburg reject, though I don't think they had Aristotle in mind at that point, but maybe. Their basic argument, remember, is that women as a class ought not be defined or restricted from pursuits according to their reproductive function or the assumption of limited rational capacity. Indeed, they argued that there's no rational reason that women, simply because they have the capacity to be mothers, cannot be lawyers, or in the first Supreme Court decision to rule such restrictions arbitrary administrator, administrators of estates. But then Murray and Ginsburg take their argument a step further still, maintaining that the law ought not assume that the traditionally feminine caregiving function or role is tied exclusively to womanhood or motherhood. Rather, they argue, and I think persuasively, that the caregiving function is the responsibility of the family or household as a whole, one that should be legally and culturally protected as such. And so as Murray articulated her position in 1865, the court ought to distinguish between those laws and policies that are genuinely and licitly protective of, the, of familial functions as a whole and the childbearing functions of women from those that unjustly discriminate against women as individuals. This all seems to me to be a very good and necessary correction of the Aristotle Bradley account. For it properly holds together the three basic aspects of human personhood that I think are reg rightly accounted for in our law. We are human and thereby rational. We are embodied and thereby male and female. And we are individuals who each instantiate our own particular way of being a male or female human in the world. Or as my friend James Mumford said in the last session, we are each someone. But if Murray arguably stopped there, Ginsburg certainly did not. She argued throughout her career that abortion rights were necessary for women's equal participation in civil, economic, and political life. In a word, to restrict abortion is to discriminate against women. So why is Ginsburg's argument so compelling and why does Ginsburg's argument go wrong? Well, I think in three ways. 
each having to do with these three aspects of personhood that we ought to hold together if we are to offer an account of law that is in keeping with who we are as human beings. So first, if Aristotle erred, I think, in overemphasizing our sexually distinctive bodies in a way that undermined the common rational capacities of men and women, Ginsburg erred in underestimating the asymmetrical consequences of sex and the costs of doing so. Indeed, Ginsburg's first error is not unlike that of Aristotle's own teacher, Plato. For in the Republic, Plato Socrates seems to affirm the social equality of the sexes, but only by abstracting nearly entirely from their sex. Like dogs, Socrates asserts, males, male humans mount and are, of course, physically stronger, while females bear the offspring. But apart from these basic biological differences, sex is said in the Republic to be entirely superficial, akin to the differences between bald and long-haired men. <laughs> Guardian women should thus be afforded work according to their talents, as men are, just as anti-discrimination law requires today. But to achieve this kind of parity of position, these elite women will need, Plato Socrates tells his interlocutors, quote, an easygoing kind of childbearing. Therein, elite women held in common with mates selected for best breeding will have their children quickly swept away from them and cared for by the lower classes, whose own children, may have been sacrificed, quote, if the flock is going to be of the most eminent quality. Elite women's educational and professional equality thus comes at a great cost to the elite women themselves, their lower class counterparts, and children too. Work is doled out by merit, but the intimate life of the natural family is sacrificed to the justice of the city. In case you missed it, Universal child care and abortion, or in Plato's time, infanticide, are necessary in this sex equalizing scheme. But well before we get to Pauli Murray and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we find voices in the tradition who also reject the Aristotelian account of women's role as determined by their reproductive function, but, don't, but who don't go the way of Plato or Ginsburg. Notably, of course, the church herself recognizes the excellence of the virgin as well as the mother. But thinkers like, for instance, Christina Pazan in the early 15th century, Mary Wollstonecraft in the late 18th century, Edith Stein and Dorothy Sayers in the mid 20th century, all recognized the great good of women's childbearing function and of maternity too, but also understood that women were individual persons with a common rational capacity to men. As Pazan wrote in 1405, explicitly rejecting the Aristotelian of account that plagued anti-woman satires of her time, quote, human superiority or inferiority is not determined by sexual difference, but by the degree to which one has perfected one's nature and morals. In 1938, Dorothy Sayers well articulated the insight that would come to ground basic anti-discrimination law a couple of decades later. Quote, what is repugnant to every human being, Sayers writes, is to be reckoned always a member of a class, and not as an individual person. A certain amount of classification is, of course, necessary, she says, for practical purposes. But then she asks, why should women not want to know about Aristotle? The answer is simply, what women as a class want is irrelevant. I want to know about Aristotle, and nothing in my shape or bodily functions need prevent me from knowing about him. So Pazan and Sayers and Wollstonecraft and Stein, like Pauli Murray in the mid-1960s, hold these three aspects together, human, male, female, individual. Ginsburg, in her effort, for instance, to trade Mother's Day and Father's Day for Parents' Day, not so much. But Ginsburg makes a second error, this time concerning what it is to be human. In rightfully, if implicitly, rejecting Aristotle's account of reproductive function as determinative of a woman's role, Ginsburg erroneously takes on a modern, mechanistic view of the body and its functions in relation to the person as a whole. To the Cartesian mind, the body's machinery and various functions are but tools the individual employs and controls according to his or her will. Of course, the mid 20th century advent of relatively effective birth control seems to confirm the mechanistic view. No longer, quote, chained to her place through the maternal functions of her nature, as Margaret Sanger put it, women can and must, for Sanger, exert total control over their reproductive function. 
that function no longer defines them, they will define it. But even if one rightly rejects the way in which Aristotle seems to define women according to their reproductive function, the Sanger Ginsburg modern account fundamentally overcorrects, undermining a proper Aristotelian understanding of the human person as a deep unity of sex body and rational soul. In unifying the person, our rational souls properly serve to govern and direct us to our virtuous end. Our sexed bodies, as John Paul II put it so well, express who we are as persons. And so female and male bodies express something important about the female or male person that cannot be mechanistically willed away by technology as hard as we may try. The fact that, as Aristotle observed, females reproduce inside themselves and males outside does not tell us everything about the person, but it does tell us something fundamental. Given that we humans are our sexed bodies, as McIntyre happily pointed out last night, there is no such thing as a disembodied human. I think at the very least they tell us this, female and male contributions to reproduction are distinctive and asymmetrical as are maternal and paternal responsibilities to children. As sexually dimorphic, telic, rational creatures, we might also want to affirm that persons attain their excellence by living according to their rational function as mediated by their embodiment and the responsibilities that obtain. And so let me conclude with Ginsburg's third error at the level of, in, uh, at the level of individuation or agency. In arguing that abortion restrictions unjustly discriminate against women's as, women as individuals, she selects male reproductive function as her comparative model. For do note that reproductive functioning, unlike every other bodily function, is only successful with both a female and a male. Pregnancy is the result of the union of male and female reproductive function, not the woman's alone. To say that an expectant mother, just like an expectant father, owes duties of care to her unborn child such that she cannot legally end that child's life is only discriminatorily disparaging of woman if one holds an a priori view that a woman's distinctive role in reproduction is itself disparaging of women. Law may have a more difficult time enforcing paternal duties, but we certainly don't allow fathers to end the lives of their unborn child when those duties are onerous. <laughs> or unchosen. Ginsburg suggests that anti-discrimination law ought to regard pregnancy as just like any other medical condition, though unique to women. Yes, pregnancy is unique to women the way that prostate cancer is unique to men, such that both the man and woman in these cases are equally entitled as agents of their own lives to make health care decisions about their uniquely sexed medical conditions. But of course, we can quite readily and rationally distinguish between the cancer removed from the man in surgery and the human child removed from its mother in an elective abortion. The first restores the man's health. The second intentionally ends the child's life. Of course, when a pregnancy gravely threatens a woman, her situation may warrant restorative surgery too. So happily, these three aspects of personhood, I've said, must be held together. Human, male, female, and individual are in fact held together in sex discrimination law today, even if it's totally under-theorized. In reviewing laws that differentiate on the basis of sex, the court takes a hard look, requiring that the state persuade the court that its reasons are not based in overbroad generalizations about women and men as a class, but rather grounded in real differences that actually exist between them. And this means that states may craft policies that, as Murray suggested in 1965, are protective of and advance both the family's function in caregiving and the woman's in childbearing. States can also, alas, restrict abortion without unjustly discriminating on the basis of sex. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Erica. Our next speaker, Leah Labresco Sargent, uh, describes herself as a writer, speaker, and instigator. She grew up as an atheist on Long Island and converted to Catholicism in 2012. And uh, is the, uh, she runs a substack called Other Feminism and is the author of the book Building the Benedict Option, which was adapted from an article she wrote for Comment ma Magazine called Designing Women. And I hope you youngsters can understand that allusion there. Uh, it's also for sale next door, and Leah would be happy to sign a copy for you if you wanted to purchase it today. Leah. All right, I'm going to begin by warning the people who are standing with their backs to the door that I have just received a text that my nine-month-old is up from her nap. So at some point during this talk, the door is going to fly open and a nine-month-old is going to enter, so just be aware in the back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to all of you. I'm speaking on woman annihilating transhumanism. And I want to start just by making the case to you all that although the most famous transhumanists are men, most frequently practicing transhumanists are women. This is the case if we look at transhumanism as the view that you know, the human body is in some sense insufficient, flawed, it could be a little better. But I think the main distinction here is that for a lot of the famous transhumanists, transhumanism is aspirational. It's a manner, matter of expanding capacity, adding to the human chassis. Uh, I, I will ask briefly if anyone would raise their hand if they also considered inserting a magnet in their finger, perhaps in their teenage years, perhaps later, for the pleasure of feeling electromagnetic currents and adding a sixth sense. So anyone in the room who considered that, it looks like it's only me. Um, <laughs> It will really mess you up for MRIs, so don't, don't run out and do that once you're done with this talk. Um, and I didn't either. But it's, it's got an excitement to it. It's a sense of, I can know the world more richly, more deeply. I think there's an element of Christian transhumanism that just comes out of a desire, I want to know creation more. I wonder if there's more I can see, more I can experience, more I can feel. But for women transhumanists, it's relatively seldom it's aspirational transhumanism versus what I would call survival transhumanism. Yeah. While the famous transhumanists are expanding what they can do, women are limiting or altering parts of themselves just to keep up. Many women who don't identify as transhumanists begin their day with at least one of two semi-transhumanist acts, taking a contraceptive pill to make sure that one essential bodily aspect of being a woman can be turned off, there's no switch as of yet, but just to say, well, this part of being human doesn't work, isn't adapted for the modern world. For all the reasons Erica laid out, this idea that without this, women can't have a body that suits the expectations of the modern world. So it may not be as sci-fi looking as if there were LEDs involved, but we'll simply turn off that capacity, come what may, for the other dramatic non-MRI messing up consequences. And then there's a second option, which I would frame as transhumanist, and I'll spend only a brief time on this hobby horse. Many women get up in the morning, look at their face in the mirror, and say, I'm going to paint a different bone structure over my entire face. And it would definitely count as sci-fi if contouring involved like a little overlay of uh, LEDs, or if you were doing this with an avatar in the so-called metaverse. When it's done with paint, it doesn't seem quite as excitingly science fictional, but it's actually very strange to have a culture where every day millions of women say, to get ready to look professional, I need to paint the face of a different woman over my face and like make sure I touch it up during the day so that my entire bone structure is different and more acceptable. It's profoundly disturbing to me. I think a great deal of women's transhumanism takes this form, the sense that there's something wrong with women and that women should try and fix it as subtly as possible so that no one has to be reminded that women make these compromises and adjustments, that we simply woke up this way, infertile, high cheekboned, <laughs> ready. But the particular transhumanist demand I really want to zoom in on here for this talk and explore in detail are the assistive technology of breast pumps. 
I want to say from the outset, I'm not against breast pumps. Um, I think they perform a profound and needed role for some women who are separated from their babies for reasons beyond their control, for women who have different sins in milk supplies, other constraints, and I want to acknowledge just having a tremendous benefit for many fathers who get the experience of getting to be the one up with the baby in the middle of the night, which, <laughs> I, for the people in this room who aren't parents yet, it may sound like it's only a worrying thing when I'm telling you that this is an opportunity, but the experience of having a baby who's in distress, who you can take care of, who then milk drunk and sleepy is in your arms, and then you have to reluctantly say, I guess I should go to sleep, right? Like, but I'd like to stay here in contemplation with this baby. And formula and breast pumps give fathers more of a chance to enter into that contemplative mode with their children. There are other opportunities, but it's a particularly sweet one. So breast pumps can form then serve a useful function. And what they promise is a kind of spaciousness, that the, the connection between mother and baby shouldn't be severed, but can just have a little more stretch in it. That a mother can, you know, at the early stages, go comfortably for a walk you know, to the coffee shop without worrying, what if the baby wakes up 10 minutes after I put her down and, and I need to come back? The mother will have the opportunity you know, to take a trip to go be with a family member who's ill in the hospital with just a little more room to both preserve her nursing connection to a baby, but also have the space for other obligations in parallel. But in practice, it's seldom spaciousness that women receive as the result of this technology. And it's not exactly the fault of the technology, but of how you respond to women and women's bodies. In practice, most women who pump at work don't have a safe, clean, even lit space to pump. They nurse in server rooms, they nurse, they pump in bathrooms, they pump in cars. And when you look at why is this, it's because that sense of stretch is just long enough to put the baby out of view. And the moment that the baby's urgent need is out of you. The reality of the baby can become kind of abstracted. It's much easier for an employer to say, oh, well, if you're just a woman who needs to pump, that's a, that's a you problem, isn't it? That's not really a, a me problem as a employer or as a steward of my workers. That's a you problem. And there are compromises that are asked of women that would clearly be unjust and impossible if the baby were present in the office. You know, even the Scrooges among us like, would seldom say explicitly, given the opportunity, shut that baby into a bathroom stall. But when it's just the woman, it's much easier to make that demand. Because the woman's own dignity and the woman's own needs aren't as urgent looking, aren't as undeniable as a baby's. Because a woman who fears for her job may reasonably be more reluctant to speak up and the baby has no shame. <laughs> when we exclude babies you know, from public life, and thank you to everyone who has brought a baby into this room at the moment. Yeah. But the babies don't care that I'm giving a talk about babies. <laughs> uh, babies are unashamed of their own neediness. And then they create sometimes a crisis for us in a world that despises need holds need and contempt because the baby won't be ashamed, can't be kind of scorned, will simply cry. And then it's up to us how to respond. But when that, that relationship is stretched, it's easier to cast the mother aside because the mother understands that the boss may not listen to her and the baby doesn't. So when we look at how we respond to women and women's bodies, I think the thing to be particularly attentive to is when we create spaciousness, who captures that surplus? Whenever we create a certain amount of flexibility and distance around need in a culture that despises the needy, that has contempt for caregivers, that views all this as kind of an optional extra, something to fit in around your main work, not as a core part of every person's life, mother, father, someone without children, everyone has needs and someone who needs them. Then what we see is that when we create that sense of stretch in this predatory world, that stretch doesn't become spaciousness for a mother. It becomes opportunity for exploitation. I think this is a real challenge because I want 
more assistance for parents and not just person-to-person -person assistance. I want the two more assistive tools, better design, thoughtful engineering. But I'm very suspicious of a world that starts from these transhumanist, anti-humanist uh, ways of thinking because then whenever it sees that opportunity for space, it goes, I can ask a little more. This extra space is for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can step away from your baby? Your baby's optional, right? You know. A breast pump is a way of giving the cry of a baby an off switch, of just saying, this is now something that you're making a choice to prioritize when you had the option to be farther away. In some ways, this is in miniature the same logic of once abortion is widespread, every baby is an affirmative choice, not just a simple, stark reality. And it becomes easier and easier to blame women for making the choice for life, rather than simply responding to the reality of a person. Easier and easier to say, well, why should we support someone who chose to have a child, rather than someone who has a child, factually? and then has to decide how to respond to that stark, unashamed need. And the last thing I really want to focus on in terms of the dangers of a certain kind of transhumanism, which is really an inhumane transhumanism now, not just an anti-woman transhumanism, one that endangers all of you men as well, is that in many ways, these tools to make life easier to navigate, to make us more interchangeable, to let us take the parts of us that are needed by others and say, I can get some distance. Don't worry, I can be interchangeable with someone who's not needed most of the time. They're not just a way of taking us away from our relational connection to others. They're a way of taking us away from contemplation. Because nursing, as opposed to using a pump, is a relatively totalizing activity. I get distracted sometimes, or sometimes I'm like, oh, I'll do a little reading, and then my daughter will yank really hard on my reinforced uh, necklace so that she doesn't break it, she just chokes me, which is cheaper. Um, <laughs> but there's a real sense to which, once there's the reality of another person, I can be distracted, but there will always be the call back to contemplation, back to full attentiveness. But many of the tools we have to help us be better workers rather than better humans are about removing contemplation from our various duties, making it easier to multitask, making it easier to step away on demand, making it easier to place our relationships to others into the time slots and places that work for the world around us rather than what would be asked for from our friends, from our families, from our neighbors, if our neighbors and family and friends were as unashamed of needing us and you know, as wholehearted and unembarrassed by their love as a baby is. And so it's that withdrawal from contemplation that I'm most suspicious of. I want to leave you with the kind of a sense of how to become suspicious of these invitations both so that you can push back individually, but so that when you see someone else in your life who's being given this opportunity for a spaciousness that you know is going to be taken from them by someone else, that you can stand in that gap and try and preserve a spaciousness that can be there for them and their baby, them and the relative they're visiting in the hospital, them and their friend who has the flu, them and their neighbor who's just a little overwhelmed this week. How to preserve that sense of spaciousness for each other an unhurried time that can really have contemplation enter. So I want to give you what I love from Alan Jacobs as his diagnosis of what he calls Gnostic capitalism. So you know what to see and how to call it out. He says Gnostic capitalism has three basic axioms. A person is essentially a mind that happens accidentally to inhabit a body. That mind rightfully has absolute power over its body. That is, in relationship to the mind, the body has no rights. Remedies for what the mind believes to be deficiencies of the body are purchasable in the marketplace. Now, Alan Jacobs was talking about primarily the transhumanist ideology of transgenderism. But I think what he's diagnosing is very widespread and I would guess turns up those little assumptions in various ways in the lives of every person here, even as you hold to other truths about the dignity of the body elsewhere. 
Because that idea that the body has no rights over the mind, that whenever there's a clash, that our duty isn't to listen to the body and figure out what it needs to flourish, what we need for us as bodies to flourish, but to think, okay, I'm so exhausted, I'm having trouble sleeping. Like, what is the drug that will fix the problem of not sleeping? What is the exact, like, range of nootropics I should take to give myself the mental spaciousness that sleep or refreshment of leisure with friends would give me? What is the messaging app that can substitute for having a lively neighborhood where when I walk, I see people? That we keep trying to sate our most basic needs by saying, there must be something I can buy or something I can fix about myself so that this need won't be as totalizing so that I won't have that baby-like feeling of wanting to cry out to be human, to have my human needs met in a human way. Where, where should I shop instead to fix what's wrong with me of being too human for an inhumane world? Women feel this pressure most sharply because babies are so unwelcome in our world, because women's fertility is viewed as a destabilizing threat to a world that thinks men and women can only be equal if we're entirely interchangeable. But everyone in this room is nipped in some small way by this demand. And so I'd ask you when you leave this conference, especially in the run up to Thanksgiving, when you see family, when there's a little bit of chaos, to ask, where am I being asked to make a compromise where I take my human needs as an embodied soul less seriously and purchase a fix for my desire to be fully human? Where do I see someone else asked to make that bargain? And where can I, instead of an impersonal tool, restore a sense of spaciousness and the room to be who we are, as unashamed as the baby who's fussing in the back? Thank you. Thank you, Leah, that was really beautiful. Now we are going to round out our panel by hearing from Pia Di Seleni, who is an S STD theologian. She's an ethicist and a cultural analyst. She was the principal founder of the Global Institute of Church Management. And prior to that, she served as the chancellor for the Diocese of Orange, California, and a theological advisor to the bishop. Her work has appeared in various publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, National Catholic Reporter, really? Um, <laughs> our, our Sunday Visitor, and National Review Online. That you're not, we're not taping this, right? Oh, we are taping it, ooh. Um, she's also a consultant member to the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, Dr. DeSeleni. Good morning, almost afternoon. Um, can I, the tech people, can I close this screen here? It's not going to do anything, is it? If I, all right, put it there. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So previously at this conference and in other venues and publications, I've dedicated a great deal of effort to exploring the fundamental equality of women and men that should lead to an intimate friendship of equality. As I continue to work on the general topic of women and men together, as well as the role of women in society and in the church, I find myself wondering if we need to step back and reflect on something even more fundamental. Frequently, I have written that St. John Paul II shifted the conversation from what women and men do to who they are. And I use the language of complementarity. However, I increasingly find this language inadequate. When I've taught on the topic of women in the body of Christ, my students simply want a checklist. What makes a man, a person, a woman, or a man? There are some expressions of this which I call pink theology and blue theology. <laughs> the thing is, when we talk about complementarity, we seem to come back to a conversation of what women and men do not who they are. When I began my work, I did so precisely because I was looking for a way to reconcile St. John Paul II's call for a new feminism with some of the many generalizations that I would hear offered. For example, 
Women are called to love and women are called to love and nurture. But then our Lord was a man and he loved and nurtured more than anyone. And he was a man, not a woman. At the same time, Western society has frequently considered the intellectual life or the public life to be the purview of, of men. But Mary, the mother of God, clearly knew more than any other human person. Many strands of Christianity, including some within the Catholic Church, have used the notion of complementarity to simply define what women should or should not do, usually in subordination to their male counterparts. I have used the phrase integral feminism to describe a way of thinking about women in their entirety, again, in terms of being, not doing. And now I'm starting to think that we need to get back to understanding the relationship between man, woman and man in terms of their human nature. Now, classical Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophy describe the, the person, the human person, as an individual substance of a rational nature. In many ways, the human person was a given for these earlier philosophers. Then, from at least the point of the Enlightenment on, philosophers and other thinkers questioned who is the human person, a process that is still unfolding today. While I very much agree with the definition of the human person in terms of her rational nature, I also think that human nature is fundamentally relational because of our rational nature. And this aspect needs to be emphasized. You see, friendship between man and woman, especially husband and wife, is not simply due to our rational nature. It's due to our capacity for relationality. And as, as I'm just beginning to explore this, I haven't quite worked out the philosophical components. I'm much better with the theological components. And with this talk today, I'd like to begin this exercise and very much welcome your feedback. So many sources can be considered, but for the brief time that we have here, I'm going to draw primarily from St. John Paul II's um, general audience from January 16th, 1980, part of his Theology of the Body, and his apostolic letter, Mulieris Dignitatum, on the dignity and vocation of women from 1988. I find that these two documents um, continue to reflect that the human person is relational by nature. And this is confirmed by a growing body of knowledge, uh, whether it be anthropology, mental health and trauma, as well as many other areas of expertise. As I begin my discussions on the friendship between woman and man, I will start this discussion similarly with a quick review of the Genesis narrative of, of the creation of humanity. From Genesis 1 and 2, we know that God created woman and man both in his image and likeness, giving them a shared work to do together. Their differences existed before the fall, as did their shared work. St. Paul, John Paul II made an important, if obvious, distinction. The differences existed before the fall, before original sin. They are not the result of sin. The differences are created differences. The tensions between women and men are a result of sin. In other words, God didn't create us with the intention that we should be engaged in an unending battle of the sexes. In fact, if we look at the initial command, Genesis 128, which comes before the fall, again, God's plan is clear. Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that crawl on the earth. In other words, God created woman and man in order that they could build up the kingdom of heaven their, through their progeny, something that we see manifested in every vocation, even after the fall. Often, the differences are confused with the tensions. So people think that if we eliminate the differences, we will eliminate the tensions. We've all experienced this lived experiment at some level, I believe, and most of us will probably agree that removing the differences has not led us back to a paradise of Eden. One could even make the case that women suffer in different ways, perhaps even more now than previously, but that is a topic for another paper or perhaps chap chapter in a future book, if I get to that point. When St. John Paul II examines these biblical passages, he talks about the original nuptial meaning, meaning of the body. And he writes, the nakedness of our progenitors, interiorly free from shame, seems to bear witness to us to this, it can be said that created by love, endowed in their being with masculinity and femininity, they are both naked because they are free from the, from, with the freedom of this gift. This freedom 
lies at the basis of the nuptial meaning of the body. The human body with its sex and its masculinity and femininity seen in the very mystery of creation is not only a source of fruitfulness and pro procreation as in the whole natural order, it includes right from the beginning the nuptial attribute, that is the capacity of expressing love, Lo that love in which the person becomes a gift and by means of the gift fulfills the meaning of his being and existence, quintessential theology of the body. St. John Paul II describes relationality, which he identified as the mutual gift of self in the general audience of the preceding week. I highlight relationality and mutual gift of self for many reasons. First, no system that denigrates either or both women and men can allow for mutuality or mutual gift of self. Both pre presuppose a fundamental equality, and as the canon lawyers who handle annulment cases know all too well, the capacity for relationality. In order for people to exist in authentic relationality, the fundamental equality of each must be a given, and they each must possess the raw materials to be capable to enter into relationships. St. John Paul II draws out this consideration of relationship, knowing that at, noting that Adam names himself only when he has someone that is his equal, namely woman. Before her creation, Adam cannot, can only name the animals. He cannot name himself. He cannot be in true relationship with, with the non-animals and hence cannot name himself or know himself. It is only in the creation of woman and in relation to her that he is able to know himself. And this is, in other words, in order to know ourselves, we need others. The second Genesis creation narrative concludes that is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. Biblical scholar Father Paul Mankowski com comments on this verse, that while it has structural similarities to the stereotype expression of folk wisdom, its content runs emphatically contrary to that experience. He cites AFL Benson, quote, in a Mediterranean near Eastern world, the norm of marriage is, and always has been, a virological, not virological, <laughs> arrangement in which the wife moves into the house, uh, household of the husband's family. Mankowski notes how radical is Genesis 2.24 in long, light of longstanding cultural concerns, norms. And from this, he draws that the verse points to the coming of, to being of a new entity distinct from either of the constituent persons. Two, the fact that this entity is single, that it is not subject to recombination externally or internally. And three, the fact that the entity is not an abstraction, but an organism, enfleshed and endowed with life. In other words, this is a radical break with any sort of local tradition, and in Mankowski word, Mankowski's words, proffered as a universal truth. The biblical narrative seems to underscore the challenges of the marital union by suddenly shifting from this radical break with every existent cultural and religious narrative, one which is essential for humanity, to the, ch to the changes of maintaining this union. Genesis chapter 3 starts right away with the temptation of the woman by the snake, the most cunning of the wild animals the Lord God had made. I just have a question about time. I thought I had till 11.45, 20 minutes. Yeah, you can take the question. Okay, thanks. I got frightened by that card. <laughs> I was going to start reading really fast. <laughs> so despite being in the Garden of Eden, which we generally understand to have been a paradise of sorts, there came to be unrest between Adam and Eve, prompted by the servant who, prompts, who convinces them to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. In other words, despite the perfection of their surroundings, despite the fact that they walked with God, me, uh, they were open to breaking the one condition that was required to maintain this perfection. Biblical scholar Scott Hahn highlights the complexity of this scenario. The English translation uses the word serpent, which doesn't mean this main match the seriousness conveyed in the original Hebrew text. Tracing scripture references, it is clear that the ser serpent is in fact Satan in the form of a deadly dragon. In other words, this is not some garden variety, uh, garden variety snake. Hahn writes, Eve faced a life-threatening force. And yet, the text of Genesis is almost blasé over now. 
Adam's wife Eve, the flesh of his flesh, the bone of his bone, is talking with this deadly force. But there's no indication that Adam is even mildly concerned. When God confronts them after their transgression, Eve owns that she did as the serpent suggested. He tempted her, she ate of the fruit. Adam, however, passes the blame on to Eve, saying, the woman whom you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Even in blaming Eve, Adam first blames God, the woman whom you put here with me. This leads me to wonder if things in paradise were amiss before the serpent showed up. <laughs> Truly, it does. <laughs> uh, one need not be a perfect husband to know that one's wife is probably not in a safe space if she's con conversing with a dragon. And of course, <laughs> There are many legitimate ways of reading scripture that allow for a different read than the one that I am providing. Nevertheless, there's a definitive point at which we see the consensual rupture of the relationship between God and his first human creatures and between the creatures themselves. Now the battle of the sexes begins and it centers on the ability to be in authentic relation. At this point, I'd like to turn briefly to mulieris dignitatum. It may seem a strange, an odd choice, but I'll, let me explain. When I first read the apostolic letter. I thought it was fine, but it took me a while. Many readings later, and this is why we read things over and over again, the classics, the same text looked, looks radically different to me. I find in it a much needed conversation on relationality and our ability to embrace reality. Perhaps only someone as direct and visionary as St. John Paul II could have written Mulieris Dignitatum. In stark contrast to the numerous abuses of women throughout history, the Pope positioned Mary, the mother of God, as the archetype of the human race. In so doing, he recovered the authentic Catholic tradition and used it as the basis for developing our understanding of the role of women. He saw that there are two fundamental dimensions of women's vocation, virginity and motherhood. To the modern ear, this sounds a little more like saying that women are nothing more than baby machines and virginity is important only as a sort of quality control. However, we risk, risking, we risk miss, missing a profound significance. We have to begin by challenging our own understanding of both virginity and motherhood. Perhaps we've been too biological and conservative in our understanding of them. In the person of Mary, the mother of God, virginity and mother co motherhood coexist. She is the mother of her biological child without having known the physical intimacy of the marital union. Aside from the overwhelmingly stupendous reality of the incarnation, she breaks yet another mold. Up to this point, consecrated long, lifelong virginity was not celebrated by any culture, not even the Hebrew. In many ways, it would have seemed a waste since a woman would not be assisting a man as his wife or in having children. There would be no visible fruit from her life at least nothing compared to being a wife and mother. St. John Paul II's vision of motherhood moves beyond the strictly biological. He, it is a unique role. I think he's challenging our ideas of marriage because he understands the idea that biblical knowledge should be the perfection of marriage, that all married couples should strive for. A marriage in which spouses do not seek to dominate each other or manipulate each other, but are instead fully open to each other and able to perfect their union, a, re a relationship. From the union of husband and wife, so me, just keeping an eye on the time here, motherhood goes beyond the biological and physiological realities. John Paul II, St. John Paul II explained further, motherhood is linked to the personal structure of the woman and the personal dimension of the gift. On the woman's part, this fact is linked in a special way to the sincere gift of self. The woman's readiness for the gift of self and her readiness to accept life. It's also worth noting that he repeatedly acknowledges that motherhood constitutes the most demanding part of parenthood. Those are his words, most demanding, even though both parents are essential. Somewhat controversially, he wrote that fatherhood depends in many ways on the mother because she experiences a more immediate and interior relationship than the father. To such a degree, he writes, the mother's contribution is decisive in laying the foundation for, the, for a new human personality. In other words, relationality. Nevertheless, the mother is dependent on the father, perhaps more so from the, for their own marital union. And again, that's something to be developed in another work. 
At the same time, that the, um, the, the church celebrates the consecrated virginity of both men and women in the vocation to the religious or clerical life. And St. John Paul II noted that from the beginning of Christianity, this has been equally applied in the form of the evangelical counsels of chastity, poverty, and obedience to both without distinction. It's interesting to know that the, the, uh, that the Pope does, that the saint doesn't specify that it is through the spousal love that a human person becomes a gift for the other. In other words, all, human, all persons, human and divine, become a gift for the other through spousal love. Too often we limit ourselves in our notions of marriage. We forget that this relationship also applies to the union of Christ and the church. As we experience it among humans, it is only a shadow of the perfect reality lived between Christ and the church. Those who answer clerical or religious vocations forego marriage with another human person so that they can devote themselves to a unique spousal relationship with Christ and his church. Although they give up physical or biological parenthood, they live out their vocations as spiritual mothers and fathers to those various people who are entrusted to them. These t the titles, father and mother, that we use to address them point to the real spousal relationship to which these individuals have promised them and in turn from which they derive responsibilities to others in their care. The spousal relationship between Christ and the church plays itself out most clearly in the Eucharist, where Christ the bridegroom gives himself completely to his bride, the church. John Paul II, St. John Paul II called it the sacrament of bridegroom and bride. Now, these considerations demonstrate how the Catholic Church, which has been endlessly maligned for its alleged treatment of women, offers a more holistic view of women, I would say the most holistic, one in which women are valued for who they are rather than for their various roles or accomplishments. In other words, simply for what they do. The distinction between being and doing is an important one as we proceed. Um, boy, goodness. Okay, we're good. St. John Paul II fundamentally believed that women are equal in dignity with men and neither can exist without the other. The key to understanding the roles of women and men is to see them in relation, in contrast to, that rea to the reality that we learn about ourselves through our relations with others, many contemporary trends and philosophies would have us isolate ourselves from others and guard ourselves even in our most intimate relations. The end result, however, leaves us ignorant not only of others, but of ourselves, and perhaps this is one of the most form, one of the worst forms of loneliness when we do not know ourselves. This is the fundamental issue, and how we live as a man or a woman affects our entire human experience. St. John Paul II explained, man can only exist as the unity of two, and therefore in relation to another human person. It is a question here of a mutual relationship, man to woman and woman to man. Being a person in the image and likeness of God thus also involves existing in a relationship, in relation to the other I. This is a prelude to the, self de to the definitive self-revelation of the triune God, a living unity in the communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, not only do we need others to know ourselves, but the fundamental questions of our identity require the other. Um, all right. I'm, our focus on individualized philosophies, along with modern advancements, have made it easy for us to live without interacting with others. Although the internet has been a tool of unlimited use and service, it has paradoxically made it easier for disconnected people to connect with others, all the while maintaining their distance, even in what should be the most intimate exchanges. Both men and women have been accept affected by this disconnectedness or this lack of union, which stems from the disruption of the original union. if I can wrap this up. Um, I think, to wrap this up and to be respectful to the panel, um, the, I, what I was struck by was just the, the importance of relationality and that it starts fundamentally with women in Molière's Dignitatum. It is women who expose the child to reality and to relationality. And men are obviously a necessary part of that. But, and these two parts have to be obviously working together. And at the end of the day, I think if we look around, we can see where relationality is not working. And it's where these relations between men and women are not working, including in our marriages, in our families. And 
I think if we look back to the wisdom of the church, uh, particularly that of, of St. John Paul II, I think his inspiration has been tremendous, we can find the, the, the tools to begin a conversation more about relationality. And again, I continue, I'll just close. I, I think it's essential to what it means to be human because we continue to see this manifested in all the sociological data and every area of mental health. So I'll close with that. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of our panelists. You gave um, excellent information at a time when I think uh, what women are is really being debated in our society. Of course, probably all of you have seen as the abortion debate has um, continued to be discussed since the Dobb decision came down. Um, you're frequently seeing um, uh, the word women replaced by birthing people. Um, the, the favorite headline that I saw, I think, was in the Seattle Times, uh, which did a story on the, some of the changes that women had in their monthly cycles after receiving the COVID vaccine, where uh, the story began, menstruators who are online began to know, so um, after all we've done, right, since the days of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, we have been reduced to being called menstruators. So I am really grateful that um, this topic of what women are is um, is being brought up this morning. So uh, we'll open up the floor now to questions, and if you could please uh, do me the favor of directing it to a particular panelist. Yes, Father. Hi, uh, Father Michael Baggett, I teach in Rome. Uh, thanks for a three great presentations. My question is directed to Leah's uh, comments here on transhumanism. Uh, I've spent a number of years researching transhumanism, and, and last week I was at a conference and sharing some of my research and I wasn't naming any names, but I was summarizing some of these more theoretical, philosophical figures, uh, Nick Bostrom, Andrew Sander, Sobolescu, and so forth. And the woman I was speaking to very perceptively asked me, but are there women who are interested in this? Are there women who are involved in this? Um, and so she also noted that she thought that women are particularly sensitive to our embodiment to this corporality that's so often under attack. I find it ironic that as a priest, I've spent more of my intellectual life defending corporality than spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> and so could you speak to that, I think, very correct intuition that women have a, a, a very strong sense of embodiment that could be a kind of response to any form of transhumanism, kind of light or theoretical? Absolutely. You know, I think that in many ways, the attenuated sense of male embodiment comes from the different risks men and women undergo. You know, historically, broadly speaking, women die in childbirth, men die in wars. And we have, live in a time where childbirth is safer than ever, but not safe. But many more men expect to never risk their life physically. Uh, and because of that, we think of our bodies as invulnerable, as kind of only vulnerable to the degradations of age, which when you're young are very far away uh, and mostly hypothetical. And I think that leads to a certain degree of carelessness about the body, that it isn't being held in readiness for a particular risk. Um, and then there's a question of what to do with it. Now I want to say one good thing about the male transhumanists and some of the people in that more experimental cycle, which is where I do see a salutary risk uh, appetite from them, right? Is I know men and women, but more men who have made an altruistic kidney donation. And that's where you're not donating for a particular recipient. You're donating because you can live with one kidney. The recovery is not as hard as you might expect. Um, and they want to save lives and that you can actually save a lot of lives. You can become part of a kidney chain where a lot of people who wanted to donate to a relative but who weren't compatible with one altruistic donor, you give to someone's father, that person's daughter gives to someone's brother, et cetera, and it kind of hmm. propagates on. And I looked into this and I thought, this isn't a risk I feel comfortable with because I think it will make my pregnancies more dangerous. Um, so that's a place where I've seen men take on a different kind of bodily risk and think about what is my body for? What is it worth risking for? But I think for the most part, many men don't face that as a question at all by default. Thank you. Helen Elvery. Um, thanks. So this is for Erica. Um, if you look at the dissenting dogs, um, 
which seems kind of rabble rousing you know, <laughs> to the demos, the women, but it ends up sanctifying just basically the counted the opinions of 14 men and four women on the court <clears throat> for the last 50 years. And then you look at the conversation since. The idea that children are a threat to women's future, to happiness, to equality, to any kind of economic sustainability, is so accepted that um, you know they, they, they make it very complicated for their needs. Do we see anything on the horizon? You know, um, I'm thinking of the mention of the Benedict Option, et cetera, but really anything. Nascent as it might be, that can really put a threat to that. Is there hope, Helen? Is there hope? <laughs> um, so thanks, first of all, for being here. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the presentations. Um, you know, it, it's funny, in reading The Descent in Dobbs, I felt all my work was vindicated. <laughs> Literally on the very first page, within like four lines, it says, women are autonomous beings. And that's sort of how then the statement of sort of autonomy, women as autonomous beings, moves through the entire descent. And that's the frame in which they're, um, so they sort of order the entire analysis. Um, very much obviously up and against the idea of human, all human beings as relational. So I actually mentioned this last year, but I'm gonna just do it again, um, that I do think there is hope because of how far um, the trans sort of ideology has pushed the envelope, jumped the shark, I probably even used that same analogy last year, in that it's, I think, inspiring um, just kind of women of goodwill who you know care about being a woman, um, especially those who have had children um, and who call themselves feminists, care about sort of women's interests, to sort of rethink the whole enchilada. I mean, that's what I'm seeing a lot of. And even, so seeing it among, I mean, there's some sort of public figures one could mention, but the work of someone like a Mary Harrington or Louise Perry, um, who come out of sort of a pro-choice position, but have really started to sort of re-kind of, I think, think because of, because of how the trans ideology has eaten away at what it is to be woman and what it is to be human, very much so, I think that's right. But even in my conversations, always in private, um, <laughs> with um, kind of leading pro-choice legal scholars who seem to be sort of, I think, wondering if the language that they entered the pro-choice movement of, of safe, legal, and rare, um, has now sort of swung so far as like abortion, literally when we talk about abortion as a sacrament of sort of the pro-choice movement, like they're kind of seeing like, wow, abortion seems to be a sacrament of our side, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think there's a way in which, um, now there's not to say that um, there's not a lot of people um, whom ha who have been so kind of disembodied, dehumanized in this whole thing um, are so hurt and broken that it's hard to get back. But so, and then, you know, kind of announcement of um, great crew to send this to you is that um, Leah and I are both part of now a, um, a website that's gonna be launched any minute um, called Fair Disputations to Advance a Sex Realist Feminism mm -hmm. um, that, that involves people like Leah and I, Abigail Follies, who's here, but then also Louise Perry, Mary Harrington, that's kind of bringing together Nina Power compact others who are really want to push back against the way in which um, this kind of trans humanist but trans way of thinking has really been of course most harmful to women so I see lots of hope hopefully you all will come uh, register for our Friday emails that will it's basically aggregating all the great writing that's already out there and then we'll hope to publish original stuff but it's out of the Wilson craft project and so be alerted watch on Twitter whatever it'll be called fair disputations uh, to advance a sex realist feminism out of um, the Wollstonecraft Project at the Abigail Adams Institute. And I just, I want to add very briefly that I think it's important to be realistic. Like a baby will never be trivial. And if we let the other side say that that's the price, that a baby could only be welcome if they won't disrupt anything about a woman or a man's life, that's never a bar we're going to clear, right? Uh, there were, there were amici briefs that were about, well, we're women who had babies and our lives turned out okay. That's not persuasive to anyone yeah. um, because babies carry real weight and costs. And the question is, why is that cost right to bear? 
And what do we need to do to soften that cost? Um, but I think it's really important for the pro-life movement to say, babies do disrupt your life as like any relationship that's central to your life will sometimes be an obstacle to other things you wanted. How do we share that burden? How do we support you through that burden? And how do we not add the additional burden of pretending that burden is light? Okay, I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so um, I will have to take one last question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you all for your wonderful presentation. My, my question is for Pia. Uh, so John Paul II and this idea of mutual relation. So in the Catechism and in his writings, he's very emphatic that both being man and being woman is in the image of God, and that Eve is a helpmate to Adam, but Adam is also a helpmate to Eve. And of course, Thomas Aquinas gets this wrong. Um, and so I, I doesn't. Okay, we can, we can discuss that. Um, the Dominicans in the back of the room are putting their hands and their heads back there. So, <laughs> so I, I think that there's um, a tendency, sometimes when people talk about complementarity, they'll carry out the woman is being made for man, especially in motherhood, and then not deliver on the second side of that equation. And so I'm curious, how can we fight this fight for motherhood that we discussed in the panel today without falling into that trap of making it so that women are for men and then where, where is the male side of that equation? That's precisely why I am pushing myself to move away from the word complementarity. I don't think it works. Um, what I had in mind is something very different than what I see other people carrying out. It doesn't work. I want to talk about a relational feminism and in that, um, I, I think we have to talk about, well, what are healthy relationships? Because even in, in our Christian and Catholic circles, we see marriages that on the outside look good, but if you know what's going on inside, you know that those people, in many cases, don't even have, as I mentioned in the talk, the raw materials to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the mental health world, um, there, there's a lot of talk of codependency, and one of the best definitions that I've come across that's not published is codependency is when you do for others what they should do for themselves. Hmm. And that's the role that I think we put a lot of women in, particularly in roles of motherhood and marriage, um, well, and family and all sorts of relationships. And instead, I'd like to be looking at, the, if, if we go back to John Paul II's idea of this mutual gift of self, that is far more radical, and it calls on both parties to give of themselves and also to work at being healthy and, and being two healthy people. And, I mean, I could spend all afternoon talking about what I think is wrong with marriage prep, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but um, I, I just think that I, I, for myself, I'm shifting the conversation to relationality, and I think that that needs to be what is a healthy relationality. And it's not enough to say, you know, whatever, I go to – so-and-so goes to mass and prays the rosary, and they're really, must be a good person and must be capable of being married. I mean, I, saw, I had one case where I was, at a, I was at a university, and somebody came up to me and told me about their plans for marriage, and I was so troubled. I mean, I've never done anything like this. I was so troubled that I actually found somebody at the university in leadership and contacted them and said, I don't think this person is ready psychologically <laughs> to be getting married. And I guess as another side soapbox. I really think that uh, Christian and Catholic colleges and universities could be doing a lot more to help people. I mean, mm -hmm. the family of origin work is all there in the annulment process, right? It's not there in the marriage prep, and we're not teaching people how to be good human beings, how to be healthy right. human beings. And university is one, especially undergrad, it's one of the most, the best places to meet a spouse. And we're all excited about people graduating capable to enter the workforce. I want to say, are we capable of entering human relationships, particularly marriage? And I don't right. think we are. And just become, just, just because we come from, quote unquote, Christian Catholic families, but we don't have the tools. And so that's, I mean, I guess maybe I should have led with that in my talk, but that, I really, I wanted to get down to, down to more of the, the philosophical and theological underpinnings, which is relationality, and it requires two equal healthy human beings. Okay, a depressing place to end, but... Um. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's a call to action. That's right. There we go. Well, thank you, all of you, and then we'll see you in the afternoon panels. And please join me in thanking our speakers.